are these people? Colin, I wanted to bring this. Um, I wanted to showcase some of the, the similarities in how the West treats Puerto Rico and Palestine. I, I found this article. Mm-hmm. And what, uh, what, what made me bring it up was, was stuff like this. Um, here's the article. But this is from uh, Melinda Gonzalez over at Counterpunch, which we're going to get into in a bit. But Pali Rican Solidarities, the dizzying parallels of colonial occupation. I'm sure we'll be making a lot of parallels with plenty of cases in this, but um, do you remember this, Care Bear? Um, yeah. Alex- <clears throat> AOC, as Kit would like to remind people is how you pronounce it, but I come from Sephardic Jews who fled to Puerto Rico. So many of our destinies are tied beyond our understanding, Casio Cortez said regarding her family. So, again, I wanted to bring up the actual what Puerto Ricans might feel are similar there now um yeah but yeah i'm this lady man one of the best actresses there is the there's always the macro and then there's Mm. the micro so again melinda gonzalez first brings us to prophet muhammad um who classically said whoever among you sees evil let him change it with his hand cannot do so and with his tongue if any cannot do so then with his heart right you know, if you've, mm-hmm. if you've ever read the Quran. Um, so they continue, as I sit to write this piece, bombs rained down in Rafa and all of Gaza. Settler encroachments in the occupied West Bank intensify. Nina sends me a message on Instagram, a picture of Palestinian journalist Peace on the Odwa, and a group of men holding up a Puerto Rican flag. Nina is in tears. I, too, feel them welling up in my throat. 268 days. Nine months, seven and a half decades, 126 years. My people have been fighting colonial occupation. Nina and I, who many nights stayed up talking about the parallels between the Puerto Rican struggle and the Native American struggle, discuss once again the parallels between Palestine and Puerto Rico. The parallels between Puerto Ricans and Palestinians are many, both occupied territories, both subject to experimentation with bombs and medicine, both experiencing disaster capitalism, both experiencing forced displacement, both dying, one slowly through austerity measures and the other rapidly through the onslaught of bombs by occupation forces. After Hurricane Maria ravaged our homeland, my Puerto Rican research participants each declared resoundingly el desastre real es el colonismo. So too, for Palestinians, the real disaster is colonialism. What does that sound like, Colin? <laughs> like, Everywhere, practically. Everywhere, yeah. Like, so <laughs> since the onslaught of escalated violence against Palestinians by the Israeli occupation in October, officials one after the other have declared that there are no innocent civilians in Gaza and all of occupied Palestine. The characterization of Palestinian youth by Prime Minister Netanyahu as children of darkness highlights a widespread mis- Y'all forgot that, huh? I d- oh, we yes. didn't forget that nonsense. Yeah. No. So, highlights a widespread misrepresentation of all Palestinians and terrorists and ignores the ongoing history of the occupation of Palestine and the legacy of the Nakba in 1948 and numerous instances of occupied force and aggression against the Palestinian people. The characterization of Palestinians and terrorists is corroborated by the U.S. government, the occupation's greatest ally in the ongoing colonialization, displacement, and genocide of Palestinians, as early as October 8, 1997, the U.S. Secretary of State designated multiple groups advocating for Palestinian liberation as foreign terrorist organizations, including the Palestinian Liberation Front, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Popular Front for the Liberation in Palestine, and Hamas. So, lots of liberation and freedom and whatnot, right? It, those those have right. terrorist organizations. Um... Palestinians are not the first people seeking liberation from military occupation. They have been labeled by the U.S. government as terrorists, label intended to dehumanize and justify genocide since at least the 1950s through the covert FBI program, Pro. The U.S. government has undermined the Puerto Rican liberation movement by classifying its activists and advocates as terrorists, thereby criminalizing their struggle and justifying continued state repression. As early as October 24, 1935, the U.S.-backed police force opened fire 
on a group of students at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, resulting in the deaths of four young Puerto Rican nationals. In the infamous 1937 Ponce Massacre, the U.S. government killed 19 Puerto Ricans and injured more than 200. In 1948, the same year as the NACPA, students protesting the Ley de, Le, Le de la Morza, which suppressed Puerto Rican independent movements, faced violent crackdowns by police, resulting in numerous injuries and arrests in the 1960s and 70s. Puerto Ricans, along with other students across the world, protested against the Vietnam War and were met with military and police repression and violence. From the 1990s and into the present, students protesting austerity measures tuition hikes, and university closures have been met with violent confrontations from police who have used tear gas and batons to disperse students, arresting numerous student advocates. Repression of Puerto Ricans does not only occur on the archipelago, but extends to the diaspora. For example, in the 1990s, a teacher at a Puerto Rican alternative high school in Chicago was revealed to be an FBI infiltrator who later testified against nationalist activists labeling them as terrorists. Taken together, all these repressive tactics are part of a broader historical process where Puerto Ricans have been racialized and constructed as enemies of the state and anti-American, and most dangerously, as terrorists. Media representations play a powerful role in this, categorizing some Puerto Ricans as deserving American. Those providing their work through upward mobility and others as undeserving ones. Criminal. Those ones who moved on up, yes? Yeah, um, it sounds like the black experience, basically, and like yeah. if, like that last sentence, basically, <laughs> like those who are more upward, those who have the means to be upward mobile you know, and like, yeah. like, and being able to do the like, are the ones that are looked upon highly, um, and that's I think kind of the issue. I think that kind of leads into FEAs and ADOS somewhat that black immigrants generally which i'm included in that yeah. generally come in and are able to go to school and go to college and like move up whereas those who yeah. are staying in the hood or are not college educated usually are considered like subhuman really well, and, like and sh they're shout, not out, really shout out to the bariquins those native native islanders of puerto rico that got colonized and whatnot and the African slaves that were brought to the island that, you know, like, as right. always, uh, you know, there, it's still black exploitation in this realm as well. So funny how that works, native populations and the like. Um, but anyway, similarly, the everyday programs of Puerto Rican nationalist activists within the diaspora are branded as un-American terrorist activities, legitimizing their criminalization and producing unequal citizen subjects. The possibility of a free and independent Puerto Rican nation continues to undermine, to be undermined through FBI and CIA programs, which use violence and surveillance to undermine local organizations on the archipelago that are aimed at self-determination, including the bombing of multiple independent party headquarters, the murdering of independence leaders and their children, including the assassination of Filberto Ojeda Rios on September 23, 2005, and the incar incarceration of Puerto Rican independent leaders and activists well into the present. Educational facilities have been a primary side of, a site of attack by both the U.S. government and Puerto Rico and occupation forces in Palestine. Palestinian schools and universities often face accusations of fostering terrorism. We're going to get to that in our next segment. And students and teachers are subject to surveillance and arrest under the pretext of security concerns. For example, Israeli occupation forces have bombed numerous UN schools through Gaza, claiming that Hamas is hiding in school, killing dozens of teachers, students, and families sheltering there. These actions serve to delegitimize Palestinian resistance and to portray the struggle for self-determination as inherently violent and terroristic. As with Puerto Rico, this labeling extends beyond the educational sphere, permeating media representations and public discourse and thus justifying ongoing military occupation and repression. From the viewpoint of the present moment, then, we can see a prevailing blueprint for the dehumanization of occupied peoples by their occupiers, one that serves to justify their ongoing disenfranchisement, displacement, and death. Talking, 
Taking stock historically, it is striking how rooted, enduring, and analogous the parallels are. Occupied by the U.S. and Israel, respectively, Puerto Rico and Palestine have been subject to settler colonial rule for 126 and 76 years. Both occupations have been marked by political and economic control with military presence and mass displacement of indigenous populations. Both occupied territories have limited self-government and lack of sovereignty, while organizations like the PLO and Hamas have come into power through elections in Palestine Neither organization has had the ability to decide Palestine's political future without Israeli intervention. Similarly, while Puerto Rico has limited self-governance and elections, the local government is often beholden to the whims of whatever the U.S. Congress decides, and the archipelago is subject to U.S. federal law without full representation, meaning that while Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens, they do not have the right to vote for the U.S. president they are residing in Puerto Rico. Like Puerto Ricans living in the U.S., Palestinians residing with the borders of Israel qualify for citizenship, but have limited civil and political representation in government, right down to something as concrete as infrastructure, for example, unequal access to Israeli roads, while those living in occupied Palestine are subject to mass police detention. Furthermore, Israeli control of the Palestinian economy through restrictions on trade, movement, and access to resources has resulted in economic dependence on international aid. We talked about this at nauseum before, yes? Yes. So, similarly, the Puerto Rican economy has been shaped and hampered by U.S. interests, leading to mass austerity measures, economic dependence, and pitted to stifle the attainment of political sovereignty and mass debt due to incentivized programs for non-Puerto Rican investors. Symbolically, the Palestinian and Puerto Rican flags were both outlawed in their respective territories and flying them has become a symbol of resistance. Both Palestinian and Puerto Rico then have had ongoing movements for independence, which were and continue to be met with violent resistance from their occupiers. The history of U.S. military testing on Puerto Ricans and Israeli military testing on Palestinians reveal further parallels. In this case, the disturbing use of colonized and occupied populations for experimental purposes. Sounds like another plight of your people, yes? In yes. Puerto Rico, <laughs> the U.S. military used the island of Vieques extensively for naval training, uh, exercises including the detonation of bombs and the release of toxic substances, leading to severe environmental contamination and significant health problems among the local population. This testing, which spanned several decades, resulted in high rates of cancer and other serious illnesses among Vieques residents highlighting the exploitation of marginalized populations that lack political power to challenge such actions effectively. The legacy of these actions underscore both the basic underlying attitudes of colonialism and the many ethnic ethical violations inherent in using the territory in a territory as a testing ground for military purposes. The violations attendant on colonialism and active occupations do not stop in social and biological labeling and control, they extend to encompass, to harm, the health of the economies of the occupied lands in question. As well, for instance, both Puerto Rico and Palestine have experienced a crushing form of disaster capitalism for the exploitation of crisis for economic gain, leading to significant displacement and disenfranchisement of local populations. In Puerto Rico, the aftermath of Hurricane Maria and the financial oversight imposed by politics, policies like the Puerto Rico Oversight Management and Economic Stability Act have facilitated both privatization and austerity measures, a double-sided baton that brutally exacerbates inequality and helps drives out migration. Acts 20 and 22 incentivized and attracted external investors, further displacing local communities. I know Lin-Manuel Miranda talked a ton about this back when he was actually trying to change the world. Um, yeah, this was a big factor. Tons of medical companies went into Puerto Rico, fucked it all up, then left, right? So, yeah. Um, in Palestine, the ongoing blockade of Gaza, violent, re re ugh, violent repression of protests like the overwhelmingly peaceful 2018 Great March of Return and settlement expansion similarly led to economic deprivation and forced displacement. Both regions experiment, experienced international interventions prioritizing profit over local needs, yet the context differs. 
Puerto Rico faces economic policies under U.S. colonial rule, while Palestine contends with illegal military occupation and systemic violence by Israeli occupation forces. Despite these differences, both cases illustrate how external actors exploit crisis to impose neoliberal reforms, deepening existing inequalities, doubling down on existing displacement, as in the Great March, and catalyzing new displacement with free market abandon, all the while undermining local resources, life force, biological integrity, and collective resilience. In Puerto Rico, PROMESA, in combination with the influx of wealthy non-residents buying property after Hurricane Maria had led to significant displacement, including via traditional gentrification, but by no means being limited to that since 2016. For instance, over 500,000 Puerto Ricans have left the archipelago due to economic hardship. The closure of over 300 schools, austerity measures that have raised tuition and the local cost of living, and a lack of medical infrastructure to deal with health crises, Puerto Rican youth struggle to find employment, obtain affordable and timely education, and are faced with an uncertain future in their homeland, many feeling forced to leave as a means of survival. Gosh, Colin, does that sound familiar? Sure it is. I think we've talked about that with Africa very much. Um, since 2016, over 11,000 Palestinians have been displaced in the most blunt object of ways due to settlers demolishing Palestinian homes and appropriating their lands. Since October 2023, the genocidal actions by the ILF against Palestinians in Gaza have resulted in roughly 1.7 million Palestinians being displaced across Gaza. Each university in Palestine has been destroyed by the Israeli occupation since late 2023, and the Palestinian youth lack access to education, healthcare, housing, and food, while having bombs rain down on them on a daily basis. The systemic targeting of youth as a form of dispossession and control of the law of occupation and apparent tool of genocide and forced displacement in Puerto Rico historical actions such as the U.S. government's placement of Puerto Rican youth in Indian boarding schools aim to suppress cultural identity and oppose Americanization. Another form of stifling not just self-determination efforts, but the space to imagine such efforts in the first place. Today, ongoing austerity measures regularly threaten university education, forcing students into extended academic tasks, class shortages, and financial constraints. Further, the closure of hundreds of schools threaten their futures and the futures of motivated students to come. In Palestine, the situation is even more dire. Schools are routinely targeted and destroyed by the IOF. Under the pretext of security concerns, several limiting educational opportunities for Palestinian children, it is well reported that the Israeli occupation forces specifically target Palestinian youth, Netanyahu's children of darkness, shooting them, maiming their limbs, and detaining them in prisons. Annually, about 500 to 700 Palestinian youth are detained by the Israeli occupation. Freedom out of sight, the deliberate targeting of Palestinian youth, underscores a systemic effort to undermine the future generation's ability to resist occupation and assert their national identity. That's, that's on purpose. In 2023, yeah. we were still uncovering the bones of massacre Native American youth in the U.S. For how many centuries will we be uncovering the mass grave of Palestinian youth? In examining the shared experiences of Puerto Rico and Palestine under occupation, we see clear and unnerving parallels in the struggles against dehumanization, displacement, and exploitation from historical mislabeling as terrorists to ongoing military occupations, naval experimentation, and disaster capitalism. Puerto Ricans and Palestinians face extensive injustice by colonial design, whether in Palestine, Puerto Rico, Congo, Sudan, Hawaii, Haiti, or elsewhere. Colonial ex extractivism and violence persist effectively unchecked. The labeling of indigenous peoples as once savages and now terrorists, while their lands are seized and their lives are taken, captures in a single stroke the brutality of colonial occupation. As Palestinians raise the Puerto Rican flag in Gaza and Puerto Ricans march on the archipelago and across the diaspora, endured in kefias and Palestinian flags, they communicate to the world that the true disaster is colonial occupation in alignment with the Prophet Muhammad. They see evil and don't look away. 
parallel histories of injustice are masked with parallel shows of mutual support, born of knowledge, sharing, and shared experiences. Here, I can both point to the empirical record and speak from personal experience when I say that the Palerican solidarity is strong and ongoing. It is in terrible abolitionist struggles around the planet are being expressed through pen, tongue, and heart. If the prophet suggests an obligation to change evil, then heeding parallel histories of colonial outrage one important starting point. Anything to add, Care Bear? It's funny that you mentioned AOC at the beginning because she. She and I remember that, like, I think she might have been on a view or something where she mentioned about her Jewish ancestry. Uh, yeah. I also know Sonny Austin, who is also on the view, who's also Puerto Rican, also has some Jewish ancestry too. They acknowledged that, yeah, you know, but given what you said, because I don't feel like most people do not know about this Puerto Rican history here, that is very much tied to colonialism and the kind of relation to what Palestine is going through that they don't talk about. So you it, so in effect she so AOC and Sunny essentially uphold their Jewish uh ancestry, which again, that's the part of your ancestry we can't take away from you, you know, in terms of like the religion itself. But in terms of what is happening to Palestine at the hands of the Israeli government, like, that's something that you're not necessarily acknowledging. And the fact that, you know, AOC has, even just this week, kind of said, you know, I stand by Biden. Well, she's stood by Biden for, since last summer, you know, oh. so... Um, so really, is is so really she, um, she she stepped in it, you know, essentially by endorsing Biden so early, uh, last year, and now she can't get out of it now. Like it's, but then again, I have to wonder, like, because it, it, it's one thing. It's I say this for black people, because because it's kind of like the, um one drop rule like it's easy to say the one drop rule like you have one drop of black in you then you're a black person but yeah. how black are you like right. in terms of the culture in terms of like knowing like the real and look aoc i'm not gonna denounce her puerto rican ancestry i'm not gonna do that but yeah. i have to ask how puerto rican are you like in terms of how are you really for like the liberation? Because right now the island is still a colony. Like they're not a state, you know. And it's funny how I've i you know, I think I might have mentioned this. It's funny how people are looking for DC to come become a state, and I'm kind of like, well, I think Puerto Rico was should get like dibs first. Yeah, you know, because you know, I don't like, think they want it. I, 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 well, with them. In, in a sense, yeah, but like I get that, but like at least the discussion should be had, you know, like on yeah. a more prevalent yeah, uh, I, I, stage. I don't think AOC is out here eating mofongo, eating noodles like anymore. I think she's right. found caviar and champagne, so. Right. You so know. yeah, it's just the idea of just kind of what someone was saying in the last segment is like you rise up you and she's been there and AOC has been especially fortunate you know, like she grew up in Westchester County. She had access to some of the best schools yeah. like in the county and then being able to go to college and all of that and having, you know, a lot of you know, being an intern in Ted Kennedy, which again, people don't talk about, like, she was an intern in Ted Kennedy's office, like, you mm -hmm. don't, and I grew up in Boston, like, you don't just get internships like that no. without them knowing, without you being really special, I will say that. So, yeah. um, 
So AOC it shouldn't be surprising that AOC is kind of really gone full establishment now because essentially she was trained to be in the establishment, yep. you know, but she prioritized that over, I would argue, her heritage and the oppression that her people are still feeling now um, that she rarely, if ever, talks about. So she gave up essentially her culture in order to align with the culture of the White House to yep. uh, better herself and not necessarily taking her people with her. So, so she's the worst sellout in the, in the, yeah. in the worst possible sense mm -hmm. in that regard. I will agree. But talking about things, things is why we're demonetized. So these messages are brought to you by viewers such as yourselves. Um, you can scan the QR code on your screen. Use the links in the description below. Go to code-v.com slash network. And we appreciate any monetary support we can get. Um, you know, and if you can't give monetarily, liking and subscribing, sharing the stream, leaving comments, all the things to help fight that suppression that you already know how to do. Everything's down there. You know the buttons to press. Um, you know, get on it. Get us to 3K. We appreciate any support. But, you know, otherwise, thanks for watching.